Uh, good morning, everybody. I will switch to English in the benefit of the uh, international audience. Um, I would like to uh, thank Luca, Francesca, and all the organization of UX conference for having uh, invited me to be the opening spe uh, speaker of uh, this conference. Um, today, I would like to uh, talk a bit about a new tendency which is uh, affecting uh, healthcare as uh, it has done in the past with other fields, uh, which is uh, the convergence of crowdsourcing and big data. When, uh, okay. uh, as, I said, as Luca said, I'm working for uh, Rezo Fish Outwear. Rezo Fish Outwear uh, is a, a digital communications agency and it is part of uh, the uh, Publicis Omnicom Group, which is the most important, biggest uh, um, healthcare uh, advertising uh, um, group in the world, and I'm working specifically on strategy. Apparently, this is not working. Yes. Um, when I started to think about this presentation and how to present myself, uh, I thought about myself, my life, and my career. And I started to understand that I can be considered a uh, UX design paradox because across my life I have changed so many times my path that uh, the final result is not easily understandable. And this is true for everybody of us. Believe it or not, at the very start of my life I thought to be uh, a fighter pilot, so I went to military school and I was a cadet officer. And then, eventually, life brought me to become a plant ecologist and then switched me to be a satellite and uh, uh, remote sensing and uh, GIS expert. And then I moved to the pharma industry where I became a, a marketing and sales executive. And lately, I became a strategy advisor, which is the main thing that I'm doing now. And I'm a Wikipedian. So I'm one of those persons, those volunteers which are building the biggest encyclopedia in the world. So what is the user experience that you can expect from me? It is in note because all the things which are converging in forming my personality and the personality of everybody of us can connect and interact in ways that we cannot expect. So every time we can have the production of a breakthrough in our lives, which is uh, the convergence of the knowledge that we have accumulated and which is the start of something completely new and unexpected. In a sense, humans are singularities, so are uh, entities which from the combination of different com uh, components, like in physical or mathematical singularities, from a certain point on, have a breakthrough following which they are completely changed their path. And uh, when we talk, uh, and we are talking uh, since uh, uh, a long time of technological singularity, we are saying that uh, this is something that more and more is going to happen in technology in general. Uh, in medicine, in particular, uh, the singularity concept is very important and it is giving birth to a completely new movement, which is the movement of uh, transhumanism. Uh, we have the so-called GNR singularity, so the convergence of uh, three apparently unrelated fields, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics. So, genetics is everything which is dealing uh, uh, about how life itself is done, and we are more and more understanding how our body, the body of uh, all the, the living beings is functioning and we are starting to figure out how to modify the very project of life. Nanotechnology is uh, the technology which enables us not only to modify but uh, to build the new structures which can be integrated in uh, uh, living systems when uh, talking about uh, medicine and robotics is uh, enabling us to build entities which can do things in our uh, place. Uh, the very, the very last
last uh, uh, moment of this evolution is having robots which are performing uh, medical operations for us, not only in surgical operations, but having uh, nanobots in our uh, uh, blood vessels which are continuously monitoring us and modifying our conditions also at molecular level when something which is out the range of normal things happens. And uh, as I was uh, saying before, this can give the birth to a completely new stage of human evolution, transhumanism, in which we will be composed by parts which are half human, half biological, and half deriving from uh, robotics or uh, nanotechnology. Do you think it's too soon? It is happening right now. This is the first one ever robot completely composed by uh, components, by prosthetic components, which are currently on the market and have been combinated in one entity. So they have taken, for example, an artificial heart, artificial lungs, uh, arms, etc., and they have built a robot which is integrating all of these things. And this person, which is one of the two engineers which have uh, conceived and built this, has in himself a prosthetic car. So these things are not the future. When I was uh, a boy, I was passionate about Teresa Kasman. So I uh, grew up with the, the sensation that uh, at a certain point in my life, having uh, a submarine traveling in, into my blood and going to resolve a problem, a health problem, would that become a, a real possibility? I, in my mind, in the back of my mind, the certainty that across my life I will see robots working among us. And this is happening right now. What is happening, and what will be happening, is that at a certain moment, as Asimov has uh, foreseen many years ago, the perfection of uh, the commixtion between life and robotics will be so intimate that the two things will not be easily distinguished. So we can go around and that is difficult to say when meeting a person if it is a robot or is a human, or is a human with the robotic components. Technology is great, but my point is the technological singularity is all, is everything we need in order to say, okay, we are progressing toward something new. Indeed, if we go uh, to if, uh, have a look to the past, we say that uh, Scientia potentia est, so knowledge is power. It's a philosophical concept which was uh, for the first time outlined by Francis Bacon some, uh, some centuries ago. His main point in uh, defining the knowledge as power is that having or not having knowledge, distributing or not distributing knowledge, can make a difference and giving a competitive advantage or not giving a competitive advantage to a person irrespectively from the fact that this person is affluent or not. So, the real point of, uh, of knowledge is that uh, it's uh, the, the main engine of our evolution. And this is particularly true when we are talking about medicine. The world medicine field is based on the asymmetry of information between doctors and patients. Doctors have not always existed. In ancient times, when uh, somebody was ill, it was brought on a public space and it was asked to all the people passing by to give a, a glance to, to, the, to that person and uh, giving an advice about how the condition, uh, what the condition was and how it would be resolved. In a sense, it was uh, 
a pre-level crowdsourcing approach to the thing. Then we had the uh, wizards, uh, which eventually became doctors, uh, and uh, the knowledge which was shared inside the community became something uh, which was uh, owned by few people into the community. This approach is present even now, because when you go to a doctor, you are normally not informed about what your condition is, what the therapeutic options are, what is more convenient for you or not. We are taking steps uh, toward uh, a greater participation of, uh, of patients to uh, the, the clinical decisions. But basically, when you are going there and saying, uh, for example, I take it from my uh, personal experience as manager in the pharma industry, I have psoriasis. Okay? I go to the doctor, I don't know what it is, I don't know what are the alternatives, I don't know how therapies can influence my quality of life. So everything which is going to happen in the following minutes and for the rest of my life in terms of about how I will live my illness is completely in the hands of doctor because I've got no knowledge, I've got no information. This is changing and it is changing because we are going toward a cultural singularity. A cultural singularity which is taking together different fields of knowledge which are enabling a change which is more abrupt of any technological change that we can imagine. And the tools that uh, are enabling these cultural revolutions are big. So, since we are at the design conference, I try to figure out how to uh, put together different pieces, as in this uh, famous picture, which are uh, unrelated apparently, but become have a sense when put together. So, the design exercise that I will do today implies taking a monkey, tapping on a typewriter. Combining it with uh, uh, Jimmy Wales and his uh, Wikipedia encyclopedia, your smartphone, and your mental record. All these things are evidently and apparently unrelated, but indeed they are converging. The first concept uh, that I have to introduce in order to make you understand how they can converge is crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is based on uh, the uh, so-called infinite monkey uh, theory. Uh, this theorem says that if you take a monkey, so an apparently not sentient being, which is not guided by a sense of purpose, you put it in front to a typewriter and allow it to, for uh, an infinite amount of time of tapping randomly on the keys, you can rebuild all the works of William Shakespeare. So you can build something which has a sense from an action which apparently had no sense, only having the, the, the sufficient time in order to do it. But uh, what does it happen when the monkey has this sense of purpose? Crossursing happens. Crowdsourcing is a condition in which people can come together without being organized. We are habituated to work into organizations which have strict rules, hierarchies, etc. Only related by an inner sense of purpose and few very simple and clear rules. By combining among themselves, these people can obtain the realization of uh, tools which are exceeding the capability of any formal uh, um, organization. I will do a practical example. 
Encyclopedia Britannica is one of uh, the most widespread uh, knowledge, uh, um, knowledge sources in the Anglo-Saxon world. If we, we look at the numbers of this encyclopedia, we see that uh, it is composed by 32,000 articles. It is uh, written in uh, one language, which is English. It is uh, the 6,000th website in the world. It is limited to English readers worldwide. And it is also limited by a factor of access. Only the ones which have the possibility to uh, buy it can access to that knowledge. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica is uh, written by 4,000 contributors, including more than 100 Nobel Prizes, Nobel laureates. Sorry. If we confront it with Wikipedia, so Encyclopedia Britannica is very structured in terms of organization. They have a sense of purpose. They bring together people and build something which has a sense. Wikipedia has. 30 million articles, so a factor 1,000 more than Encyclopedia Britannica. It is written uh, in uh, almost 300 languages. It is the sixth most visited website worldwide. And it has three, uh, 365 million readers worldwide. There is no access problem. Everybody can access to Wikipedia from any place in the globe. So, uh, one of the most common critics uh, which uh, Wikipedia takes is that uh, the accuracy of its articles is not comparable to the ones of uh, a traditional encyclopedia. Really, in 2005, Nature made a confrontation between the quality of articles on Encyclopedia Britannica, so the, sta the gold standard, and the Wikipedia in scientific matter, and the quality was remarkably the same. What is more important? This thing is built by 142 staff people, which are not working to Wikipedia itself, but uh, are maintaining all the infrastructure which is behind Wikipedia, the servers, etc. So very limited stuff. A simple technology of uh, information sharing and editing. They are living on individual donations. So that's quite random. I'm not selling the, th the knowledge that I build, but I'm asking the world to give me one dollar per year in order to sustain a thing that I'm doing voluntarily. What is more important? Wikipedia is done by 350,000 unpaid volunteers. So, no Nobel laureates, no staff, no nothing. These are sentient monkeys which, at a certain moment, have decided that uh, they wanted to contribute to humanity and build in something which is ruled only by inner rules. They have not met in real life, uh, with the exception of uh, a few. They are collaborating to the biggest knowledge effort of uh, human history, and they are building uh, the biggest uh, human knowledge uh, repository ever built by being uh, at home and collaborating. So, what can we derive from this? <coughs> Despite the fact that the knowledge building task can look taunting to our eyes, it is not impossible to attain a result. In the moment, you have the right amount of contributors, the right amount of rules, and allow people to freely collaborate. Having talked about uh, crowdsourcing, we talk about big data. So, big data is uh, a term which uh, normally is of difficult interpretation because there is no unique uh, definition of what big data are. But conventionally, big data are uh, data sets which are so big and complex to collect, 
store and manage that uh, are not uh, easily uh, managed by traditional structures. And uh, the big data landscape is something which is progressively and rapidly emerging in our world because uh, it is happening something uh, uh, of which Luca was giving uh, a glimpse before by showing this few of them. The big data, especially in healthcare, are becoming possible and widespread because there is a multiplication of sensors which are collecting data from uh, apparently unrelated sources and are putting them together once they are connected. The main difficulty of managing big data is that naturally all those data have need to, to be put in relation and analyzed in order to give answers. And uh, this has uh, a very interesting consequence. The day, the single day, so 24 hours in which we will produce more data than the ones producing the world, uh, human history, is very near. So you understand that this is something incredible happening to us in the, in the space of the of last few decades. When we relate this to medicine, uh, we completely change level. The organization of the most part of uh, the um, healthcare uh, organization is still based on the medical record, paper. Paper, not only, uh, it is not standardized, so if you travel across the countries, the type of data for the same illness which are collected in order to form an analysis is completely different. And uh, it is not active. Uh, it is not possible to put all these data together, cluster them, analyze them, and derive the responses. What it happens, uh, as of now, is that uh, for clinical studies, few thousands of people are analyzed in relation to their clinical data and from this we derive certainties about how uh, a certain drug is, uh, is um, uh, behaving. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar about the process of the commercialization of drugs. Uh, the development of drugs uh, has uh, four main uh, phases. The first one is the the clinical research, which is uh, performed in vitro, so in, uh, in laboratory. The second one is the experimentation on animals. The third one is on uh, healthy volunteers in order to assess whether this drug uh, is toxic or not for humans. And the fourth one happens after this drug has hit the market. So, is the so-called post-marketing surveillance. Be conscious that all the drugs that you use before hitting the market and being used by you have been tested only on a few thousands of individuals. So, what does it uh, imply? It implies that uh, the way the drug is going to interact specifically with you is not easily foreseeable because the statistic sample which have, uh, has been used in order to uh, test this drug is remarkably small with respect to the world humanity. So what it happens is that uh, from time to time, think about the Biox uh, case, <coughs> drugs when tested on a vast amount of people prove themselves to be unsuitable for uh, a, a wide use. And this has uh, huge medical implications. Just because the statistic sample on which we uh, test drugs is not big enough. And uh, the surveillance is not uh, timely and precise because it is based on this, on paper medical records. So paper medical records needs, need to be taken, informatized, clustered, and aggregated in order to derive tendencies. 
But what happens if this surveillance uh, process happens throughout our life and it is not limited only to few individuals which thankfully come in contact with uh, medical experimenters? <coughs> it is the age of quantified self. So the quantified self can resolve this apparent uh, discrepancy between what it is possible to measure and what it is effectively measured in terms of our clinical state. The explosion of sensors, not only few events, but we will add some good examples slide across this conference, is allowing to measure things which apparently were not possible to be measured before. And what is more important is that this measurement is continuous. It's not like uh, sampling once and testing how a certain drug or a certain condition uh, is, uh, uh, is happening to us. But it is condition, uh, it is continuous across our life. Uh, an important thing that I want to, to underline is that uh, this is possible only if the monitoring the technology is invisible with respect to our lives. So we don't need to input data as patients or as doctors, but the measurements are happening directly and passively as a result of uh, sensors function. This is very important. All of us uh, have seen uh, uh, Star Trek movies or, and, uh, and televisions uh, across the years. And one of the things that uh, uh, was more attractive uh, for me as a boy was a medical tricorder. So a tool which enabled everyone to examine a patient and derive an indication about uh, the status of health. Uh, this was science fiction, but indeed this is happening right now. The uh, X Prize organization has put on disposition a, a $10 million award for the first one, which will uh, build a functional tricorder. And they expect to assign this prize in the next five years. Again, do you think it is too soon? It is not too soon. We already have this kind of uh, experiments in the medical field. This is an existing tool by General Electric, which is uh, resembling, uh, in a sense, a tricorder, even if, if it is uh, for uh, a specific uh, uh, therapeutic area. It is a portable recorder. It's like a smartphone. You can bring it around on point of care, and substituting the, bulk, the, the bulky machinery that we have, that you have using before for doing echographies with this. When we manage to integrate more sensors into this, we will have to record. So it is not too soon at all. It is happening right now. So let's try to connect the dots. When we have the possibility to collect the data for a wide array of uh, medical sensors, cluster them, analyze them, and then then generate uh, answers automatically, we can have a singularity in our knowledge of healthcare. We have, in terms of knowledge, and not in terms of technology, because this time by uh, GL Care was technology, we already have some cultural singularity prototypes in this. The first one was the TEDNET, which is the uh, medical counterparts of uh, TED. Uh, this organization, for the first time, put together uh, medical speakers and allowed the TED then to talk about uh, healthcare problems and making uh, this, uh, this content, this knowledge, at disposition of uh, all the world simply because they integrated in their system an automatic translation tool 
which is translating the speech of the, an Indonesian doctor, which is talking in Indonesian in all the possible languages of the world. And this tendency is uh, evolving in, uh, in this kind of tools. Video is a portal which is uh, specifically aimed to integrate the medical knowledge, not only for doctors, because TEDMED is uh, something which is uh, naturally restricted to medical people, but also with patients. So, for the first time, patients all around the world have the possibility uh, to look at videos which are in their own languages and learn things, share experiences. This kind of approach is also applied to research. The traditional pharmacological research was based on the fact that pharma industry were gathered together biologists uh, and uh, other healthcare specialists and made the research for a consistent number of years investing a huge amount of money because every drug which hits the market is a result of discarding approximately 250 drugs, candidate drugs before hitting the market. So it's a huge investment. Uh, with respect to the traditional system, this goes a step further into integration to crowdsourcing because Kaggle simply puts the medical problems online and asks to the scientific community to resolve them. So, what is the consequence of that? Possibly the R&D uh, team of uh, I say a uh, pharma company, Novartis, <laughs> has not the capabilities to resolve a certain problem. So it can run around this problem for a long time, employing the resources without having an answer. But possibly the answer to that scientific uh, problem is in the mind of a South African student of medicine, which has that knowledge, but cannot share it only because he's not in the R&D team of uh, Novartis. By putting uh, the scientific problems online and naturally promising awards for uh, the resolution of those problems, you externalize the R&D process and allow what is more important, a more efficient and a faster progression of scientific research. Kettle is not the uh, only example. Innocentiv is another, which uh, brings this, uh, this concept uh, uh, to a, another stage. And this is happening also in uh, uh, patient communities. Patients like me is the example of uh, a community where uh, patients can discuss their illness. And again, is the equivalent of the old public space where people in ancient times were bringing people asking for an answer for their condition. This is that square on steroids. Uh, by putting patients like me or tools like this in a Spanish example, personas que, uh, social networks, so social networks are dedicated to patients. Together with knowledge repositories, we can generate a uh, knowledge singularity which involves the way patients consider themselves and putting an end to the asymmetry of information between doctors and patients. But at the very end, we are at a UX conference. So, I'm a UX expert. What I can do in order to participate into this. So, you should have to remember uh, um, some things. The first thing is that people are different types. People definitely are not innovators in the adoption of every, every product and every new cultural meme. 
you have innovators, you have people which is adopting this thing quite later, and you have laggards, the ones which are adopting uh, this new thing only when it is old. And this process is very important because only by completing uh, the process you can embed the new product or the new knowledge into the society. And this happens only when UX is good. UX from a knowledge standpoint, because if I take a new object, I'm an innovator, I try it, I look at it, it is not good. I'm discarding it and the other three faces are not happening. The same thing with knowledge. If a new notion comes to my eyes, I examine it and for, uh, for something which is uh, not directly connected to the, the, the nature of that knowledge, I don't understand it, I discard it. That knowledge can be of advantage for me. But I'm discarding it not because it's not valid, but because the user experience associated to that knowledge is not good. The second thing is that people are, are lazy leaks. They don't want to move. One of the main goals of nature is energy saving. I don't want to move from my comfort area. I don't want to change my products. I don't want to evolve my knowledge. I'm talking about the average humanity. So, in order to move from uh, my comfort uh, zone, I need to have a, new, a user experience with the new things which is understandable. And some of the things that we are bring, uh, bringing out in terms of technology, which apparently is cool, are not easily understandable by people. I'm talking about Google Glass. Google Glass is something which is not answering to the assumptions that I was doing before. Technology, in order to generate big data and so being beneficial from the knowledge standpoint, needs to be invisible. Google Glasses are very visible. I need to interrupt what I'm doing for looking to the screen on the, on the right. I need to give a vocal, uh, vocal comments. This is not exactly what I would like to expect from a tool like this. I would like to have something which is integrated with me and give me the information that I need exactly in the moment I need it without having to modify my, my behavior and the things that I'm doing. If we talk about patients, they are preoccupied babies. They are not feeling good. They want answers. They want to be reassured. They want something which is talking to them in a way that they can understand. Medical jargon is simply not adequate. Flashy medical websites, which are presenting the most interesting knowledge of the world, are not adequate. And I'm not acquiring that knowledge simply because UX is not good. I would like to do some bad design examples. In this mechanism, everything is evidently uh, functioning. So, I can shoot, but the result is questionable. We have uh, many examples like this around, and the first example of, uh, sorry. <laughs> Shoot. <coughs> the first example that I want to, to bring to your attention is exactly the, the thing on which I spend most part of my spare time, Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a user experience which is incredibly bad. The design is questionable. Look at this fish. Look at it uh, at it. Uh, with the eye of a UX expert. There is no proportion whatsoever. The, 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 the information 
which is presented is not easily understandable. Believe me, I, in Wikipedia since more than six years, I spent one, spent one year in uh, understanding all the basic principles of Wikipedia. And you need to be motivated in order to do it. Because Wikipedia basically suffers from the fact that it has been developed by developers and not by user experience experts. So they were not prepared to say, okay, this is a crowdsourcing tool which one day will be used by all the world. This is a tool that we want to understand and so we develop it the way we like, which is not the best way. Some uh, years ago, Jimmy Wales famously said Wikipedia is dying because at a certain moment of its life, Wikipedia was steadily losing the contributors. The justification that Jimmy Wales uh, brought was that uh, most of the initial wave, uh, most part of the initial wave of contributors were grown up, they developed uh, families, interests, works, etc. And they didn't want to contribute anymore. This is only a part of the way to it. In my opinion, Wikipedia is not attracting new contributors simply because the user experience is bad. The vast majority of people has the attitude to write on word processors. So Wikipedia should look like a word processor sheet. That's all. Another example for, uh, from the medical field. This is uh, the, an example of a medical lab, which theoretically should have to act as a uh, decision-making uh, uh, um, help for uh, doctors. When you start to use it, you realize that uh, you spend more time in juggling between the symptoms, conditions, scores, etc., etc., than uh, you spend with your patient. So this is incredibly accurate in terms of uh, diagnostics, but its uh, user experience is incredibly bad. This is an app which you will never see again. So, as I was anticipating before, the, the role of user experience experts is making the user experience good, is going into the healthcare field, understanding what the needs are, looking at bad design and uh, making it better. Because only having this, you can have people contributing to this revolution. So you should have to make things simple because people is prepared to uh, understand simplicity. And, uh, sorry, you should have to collaborate because the approach of crowdsourcing is collaborating, but, and uh, finally, we can find the, the final healthcare-related answer to all the questions of the world, which definitely we don't want to be 42, but uh, <laughs> something which has much more sense for us. Thank you.